This is the worst homestead on YouTube, and we're gonna be talking today about permaculture. What is it? Why should you care? Does it apply to you? Let's get to it. All right, guys, so I know I get a lot of stuff on beekeeping and a lot of gardening videos on my no work gardening, no, no effort stuff, chop and drop, but there's actually a bigger picture to this. I am engaging in something called permaculture practices. By the end of this, you're gonna know the ins and outs of if it's something right for you. So again, I came to the game late for gardening and it was all about COVID. When COVID hit, oh my gosh, there is a week of food supply in this supply chain and I know that the supply chain is running out, right? Because I was in manufacturing. So I had about a one week head start. Now, everyone was screaming about COVID that, at that time. Everyone was just head in the sand and were ignoring it. So I really got into food production and I applied my industrial manufacturing skills to gardening and made it to where it was little to no effort or work for me to grow food. And I didn't knew nothing about gardening. Well, after extensively continuing to search for easier and easier ways to do it, I came across methods like the Ruth Stout method, right? Build your own compost with your own soil, stop buying expensive inputs from the store. And then that led me to back to Eden method and comparisons between the two, very, very similar. And then I use my manufacturing skills to angle gardens in a way where they would self water when it rained. And then the Ruth Stout method would then keep it moist so I never had to water it. Now I'm getting somewhere. And that research eventually led me directly to permaculture. Culture. Someone had already thought about this and that's nature, right? And it's basically creating an ecosystem that supports itself instead of a monoculture that doesn't support itself. And we are not necessarily creating the local ecology around you, but we are mirroring the way we grow food, the way we have animal husbandry or the way we manage the land by mimicking our local ecology, right? So if you're in Arizona, you shouldn't be doing things that they do in New York. If you're in Minnesota, you probably shouldn't be doing things that they do in Florida. If you're in Georgia, you should probably look at the local ecology around you and find fitting perennials and gauge your rainwater and your seasonal benefits to then design a permaculture system for you. So it's incredibly flexible. So what have I done, right? So starting a year ago, so for me, the biggest component was didn't matter what soil you had, start capturing water on the land. And my answer to that was wood chips. I called local a local tree company, I had terrible soil, all red clay around here. And I said, yo, you can start dumping your limbs, not trash, but limbs in my yard and we'll spread it out. And so if you go back to my what is back to eat method video right here, you can see the beginning of that. The next thing is while a lot of people come to look at my how to grow sweet potatoes in a five gallon bucket video, and some gardening tips. Those are all annual based. A permaculture ecosystem hopefully grows most of its food from a perennial based. Annual means every year you're planting them. These are your tomatoes and these are your peppers and these are uh, your squashes. And their job is to grow quickly, produce a lot of seeds, die, and then the next year grow again, right? That's what annuals do, right? And so there was this producing a lot of seeds and then we as humans figured out we can store them, which led us to a predominantly annual based diet. Perennial based is things that you plant once and they forever, right? Let's go back to Greece. You had olive tree, plant a tree, every year it will produce you food. Uh, apple trees, plant a tree, every year it'll produce apples. Oak trees, feed cattle, every year it'll produce acorns. Those acorns you can then feed to your animals. Animals you can then eat, right? So that's a more example of permaculture. I'm gonna do a apple orchard. Now you're gonna have 500 apple trees, all the same and they're spaced exactly apart. And it looks nice and you need to be doing these ratios that university says. Well now if you get a single fun fungus variant, you don't have genetic diversity, it could wipe your whole thing out. In fact, this has happened time and time again, right? The Cavendish we used used to be the Gros Michel, right? The bananas we used to eat used to be the Gros Michel. And now what we eat in the grocery store is a Cavendish. And if you think, you know, if you've ever had banana flavored candy and it doesn't taste like real bananas. It does taste like real bananas. It tastes like an extinct variant of a banana, the Gros Michel, and your grandparents remember eating it as a kid. And that is the banana flavor. And then you eat a real banana today. And that was due to a monocrop that got infected with fungus. It killed everything. And so what can we do? We can mimic ecology, right? So you have your local nature. So for me in Missouri, 
We have, uh, historically, it was a oak plain savanna. You had oak trees, you had pine trees, you had uh, rotational grazing from bison, you know, before the 1870s when the U.S. Department of War decided to kill off all the bison to fight the Indians, right? Before that happened, you had large bison that were eating and clearing the vegetation. Well, we can substitute those bison for cattle today. The trees, we can say, you know what? Uh, there's oak trees all over Missouri. I'm gonna plant chestnut trees. They're cousins, they grow in the same soil. Chestnut trees produce chestnuts and chestnuts are very nutritious and they are basically a good flower altar. Hazelnuts are all over the place. They're a wild shrub and bush, right? So now you're planting up here, you're planting a three layer crop. And you're mimicking the local ecology. So I've got a chestnut tree up top. You know, maybe I have some hazelnuts down below. Uh, which will produce, you know, Nutella and oils and fats. Um, and you can also burn the shells if you want to. Then under that, you have your other layer, right? Blackberries grow wild here. Okay, well, my blackberries that grow in the wild have thorns everywhere. So I'm going to put a bush layer there. All right, so instead of running through and I'm spraying for pests, I planted different things, which is going to attract different pests. So even if I lose a full crop, as opposed to, let's say I just planted all tomatoes one year, and I'm gonna be a great tomato farmer. The conditions weren't right that year and I lose all my tomatoes, well, I'm screwed. But if I had a variety of things, then I could probably make it on my own for food preservation. But let's take that genetic diversity and extend it one more time. When you have all these different variations, you have different predators and pests. You have pests specific to apples. And what do they find? They find a, an abundance of apples so the pests grow out of control. But when you have a this kind of tree and that kind of tree and this kind of tree and that kind of tree and this kind of tree and that kind of tree, you have less of a buffet for the pest to choose from. Then I, and all this is hilarious, it started with bees, I plant all kinds of sacrificial plants and I also have flowers that I plant in my garden that attract insects. Insects come to pollinate the plants. Well, those insects attract predator insects. So I've got wasps that are picking off aphids and squash beetles and they're feeding into their young. But then I have birds coming and picking off those wasps. So now I have predator layers that are protecting everything from me. But again, if I had just tomatoes and I had a pest load that attacked tomatoes, I'm gonna lose a lot of tomatoes. But if I have this genetic diversity where I have enough of different things all around, I'm gonna attract pests that could be something else's predator that could take care of the pests that are on there, right? Uh, you see this with um, squash planters, right? A lot of the times people will plant a, I can't remember, I think it's like a blue, blue squash. It looks a little blue. That blue squash attracts tons of pests. And so they'll plant it around all their acorn squash and their butternut squash and their other squashes they don't want messed with because they want to take their squash and that squash be sacrificial, right? If you're growing a lot of lettuce, maybe you just plant a bunch of stuff around the outside sacrificial. Now they're perennials. I love blueberries here. So my bush layer includes blueberries and raspberries. That is that lower level. And so on the same square footage, imagine this folder. This is one square foot of your land. This is one square foot of your garden. This square foot, if I'm in traditional gardening, can grow one thing, maybe two things. Maybe I squeeze some onions around it, and then maybe I get a, uh, you know, a pepper in the middle, and maybe I have some lettuce growing the side. That's not very much, it's one layer. But in a permaculture standpoint, you go walk in the woods, go in Arizona, and you just walk into the brush, you're gonna see there's an ecosystem. There are multiple things occupying different layers. For me, you're gonna have the tall canopy layer, Right? There's those chestnut trees, there's those apple trees. Then you're gonna have your shrub layer and that's gonna be my raspberries and blackberries and uh, you know whatever other things I want. Then I'm gonna have the ground layer. That's where I'm gonna be planting my annuals, my squash, my whatever. Then there's a subterranean layer. You can grow fungus, right? All those trees and limbs are gonna drop wood. You can inoculate that with uh, spores for oyster mushrooms, Kentucky mushrooms. Now you're growing on what was breaking down. Well take a, a water bottle size, right? This is about three inches wide. Three inches wide after year one will produce years worth of mushrooms for you to harvest. And what will be left will be this like crumbly, soft soil ready to go. Now that soil is adding on top of your permaculture layer. And so when it rains, it's retaining that moisture because the soil's light and fluffy. I, as the human, am, have mimicked nature. So nature is taking care of my food for me as opposed to the alternate Gardening, which is hilariously what a lot of the viewers came to my channel for, gardening is usually a lot of work. It's toilsome, you're out there in the sun. The human being is replacing nature, so the human has to do a ton of work. 
I use good design. My outputs are the inputs for something else, right? When my kitchen scraps, uh, I save those up. I give those kitchen scraps over to the chickens. The chickens eat them and then they poop them out in nitrogen into the garden and the yard. That nitrogen and then it hits, mixes with the soil and then it breaks down and then it's going to the trees and it's producing more food and I'm gonna collect that and it's a cycle. I've now closed the loop, right? Instead of having a trash service, now be overburdened with my food scraps that are gonna go to a landfill, be buried, having an anaerobic decomposition, producing methane that released in the atmosphere. You know, first off, if you don't even care about the earth or whatever, that's fine. From a money perspective, you could have turned your food scraps into compost instead of buying it. I actually got into this not from earth care. I knew it was important, but that wasn't why I did it. I did it to be more sustainable. So my family unit, my wife and I, and one day when I have kids, that unit can produce its own food and its inputs become the outputs, right? All right, so now you have this system in place and then you have cattle or chickens grazing it. Those cows can be grazing the land underneath. They're keeping all the weeds down. I'm now no longer mowing. At the end of the season, I can eat cows, right? Or whatever is appropriate for your area, maybe it's sheep. So now for that same square meter, square foot that you have in your garden, you've got all these layers of production and they fill a different niche. And those all attract all kinds of different predators, all kinds of different pests. And those pests often will fight each other. So you are mimicking a wildlife ecosystem, but you're setting it up for food. Permaculture exists, it doesn't have to be. Now you're just mimicking what's going on. Doesn't mean you have to live out in the country like I do. Could end up buying stuff. This will work in an urban environment. He lived in the middle of Tucson, he lives in the middle of Tucson, Arizona, and his house is an oasis now. He has so much food, people will walk, they're meeting their neighbors, they're interacting with people. They're having a great community because of the trees and the permaculture things that he modeled. What if I'm just in the backyard? You can do that too. What if I'm in the city on a terrace? Okay, you can mimic the local ecology of your area, grow some perennial plants or annual plants on your patio that's up there. I mean, depending on where they're at. They're, New York City has beehive associations, put a beehive on there. Let those bees pollinate, bring all that food back. They're working for you. Now interact with the bees, pollinating your plants. This will work from the smallest scale all the way to the biggest scale. I have several videos here with Mark Shepard. Mark Shepard, he does this on farm scale. When you have 500 acres, you have 700 acres, you have 2,000 acres, you call Mark Shepard, he's gonna design your land with restoration agri design. And you're gonna do this holistic management, figure out a plan where you can take crapped out farmland or land that's not suitable for farming and within five years, turn it around, right? If you've ever seen his Cranmore location, three years ago, it was shale, barren shale. And now it is this lush, crazy thing. Things are growing. He's got seven or eight young entrepreneurs, young farmers. You know, he's got a cattle grazer. He's got someone that makes hay. He has a blueberry farm on there. They're all leasing in. They're making a livelihood. And they're doing that for him. And they're doing that on land that three years ago, or this time four years ago now, was completely unusable mirrors food production in the image of nature. So nature does the work for you, so you don't have to do the work. I am one of the laziest people you've ever met. So I'm setting my homestead up as a permaculture-based homestead. I, when I'm 80 and 90, it's gonna be producing food and I'm gonna use animal and animal husbandry to manage ground so I'm not having to do it. So this is just the introduction to it. You're, you're supercharging pollinators, you're giving wildlife. People who put permaculture installations in, almost the first thing that moves in, you have ducks. Geese will move to your area and they don't leave. Well, they don't leave because look at this beautiful nature, this, this thing, this, this, this self-sustaining ecosystem. Talk about some insect predation. Ducks are super predators when it comes to it. They are the alpha, top dog. They will clear your garden and they're not like chickens. They don't scratch. They'll go and they'll take care of your insect problem. If you can trick them to live in there because you have all the resources, that's amazing. Now you have free pest control, not spending money on Roundup. You're not spending time pulling weeds, right? You're, you're letting nature do it with cover crops and composting and mulch. A lot to it and this is the intro i'm going to be going through all of these i'm going to be bringing on guests to speak to you the audience because i want to teach you how to do it i want you to be able to do it i was once hopeless i was just a city slicker thinking you know what i grew up in the country i don't know anything about food production now i'm like oh my gosh as i'm older i want the sustainability i want my outputs for my family to go into inputs from my farm that they go back into their outputs from farm become inputs for my family. It's a small circle. If you go back in time just a little bit, 80 years ago, pre-World War II, pre the chemical era, pre-DuPont, all the, the United States and most of Europe lived on 50 to 80 acre homestead. There's 
thousands of acres owned by few people. They don't know anybody. You don't have any sense of, you know, uh, community. I'm trying to bring America back to that. You can do it wherever you live. You can make an impact. Even if it's just growing tomatoes in your garden and you do it in a sustainable way, your garden patio, that is worth pursuing. Guys, if you like this kind of stuff, please remember to like, subscribe. If you got any value about this, please give me a thumbs up, make a comment down below what you would like me to see. But if you think this could help someone that you know, please directly share this video with them. Because in this day and age, behind a keyboard, someone can type some code and boom, I never existed. I'm bottom of the barrel because I said something that YouTube disagrees with. I wish you the best of luck. Don't be afraid. You're gonna make mistakes. Get out there and grow something. We'll see you next time. Woo! Bum, 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 bum,